This presentation is going to be based on the 2015 IRC, which went into effect uh, February 2018 here in Louisiana. And, you know, probably there's not a week that goes by that I don't get a phone call, and Chris could probably back me up on this, from a the contractor, window man, window salesman, I call them window men, uh, but, you know, window salesman, uh, uh, homeowners, wanting to know, do I need to have tempered glass here? Or do I need it there? So, we just thought that it'd be a good time to put this on. All right, hazardous location. So, the code book calls tempered glass, basically it's glazing. So, and it identifies certain locations where you need to have this glazing. Doors, uh, uh, windows that are adjacent to doors, in, you know, certain windows, guard railings, wet surfaces adjacent to stairs and ramps and landings. So basically, if you have a door and it has glass in it, unless it's smaller than three inches, the, wind, the, the glass in it needs to be tempered, unless it's uh, decorative. There are some exceptions for decorative, you know, for decorative. This is probably one of the areas that probably gets the, the most rejections and uh, the most questions. And what it talks about is windows adjacent to doors. So, uh, you know, within 24 inches. So you go glazing and fixing operable panels adjacent to doors shall be considered a hazardous location where the bottom edge of the window is less than 60 inches. So what it's saying is 60 inches in height, the glass below that would need to be tempered if it's within 24 inches of either side of a door in a closed position or where the glazing on a wall is perpendicular to the plane of the door in a closed position. So, or within 24 inches of the hinge side of the swinging door. And I do have some illustrations in here that'll kind of, you know, bring it to light for you. And here are the exceptions, decorative glazing, where there's an intervening wall. So if you have a, a wall right here, it's, you know, blocking where the door would swing and the, and the, and the windows within 24 inches you know, that, that would be okay. Accessing a closet of storage area less than three feet in depth. This was uh, one that came up and basically what we're talking about is like an interior door and you have with, you know, next to a wall uh, within two feet. If it's just a shallow coat closet or something, don't need it, but if it's an entranceway like into a master closet or something like that, then, you know, we'd be looking for it. Or another exception is adjacent to a fixed panel of a patio door or atrium door. Okay, so here's a little illustration. This is where it talks about the, uh, the, the separation. Here's your, your, your five foot line, your 60 inch line, and this is where it's called safety glaze and is required on both sides of that. You know, a lot of people in the past always had the impression that if the door didn't swing into it, it didn't need it. And, you know, so. That was one of the things, I thought they were going to make a change to that. I remember it was up for discussion a while back, but still in the code this way, so this is the way we enforce it. All right, here's another illustration that shows the door to 24 inches. It's got the little, little mark right here and it shows you, you know, where it's required or where it's not required. You see this is an intersecting wall right here at 24 inches, so it's not required over there. Another illustration. 24 inches where it's required. You know, some of these window sales, they say, oh, it's 24 inches, you putting it. <laughs> when in doubt, put it. <laughs> the problem is, is, you know, what, what I hear a lot from the, the window industry is, Charlie will be selling a window, or he'll be quoting a set of plans, and Alan will be quoting the same set of plans, but Alan won't put on there, you know, safety glazing in this location. But Charlie will, next thing you know, Alan gets the contract on it and all of a sudden he's got to do a change order later, you, you know. <laughs> I'm just, look, you could, re you could reverse this, but I hear it all the time. <laughs> I think you're going to throw it under the bus. <laughs> I hear it all the time. Alan's getting the next bid now, huh? <laughs> I hear it all the time from builders, so, uh, you know, just keep that in mind. And, and you builders out there, make sure you're, you're questioning these things. These are your plans. You should know the plans, go through them, look at them, and, and, and throw those questions up when you sit with these guys. I think the interior door is the big one. 
and and that's where I think a lot of the the interior door basically you don't need it because you're going into a closet or something. Yeah. Now, if you're going into a, another bedroom or something like that, or or another room, then yeah, it, it will be required. Or a deep walk-in closet. Or a deep walk-in closet like that master closet, or you know, little Charlie's closet for his wife's clothes. You know, <laughs> it's like a like a whole other house. <laughs> I have a question. Yes, sir. Bifold doors. Where the door doesn't swing is what I'm talking about. You know what I'm saying? It don't really have anything to do with the swing of the door. It's the it's the entrance way where you're walking in and walking out. That it's more to do with that than actual the swinger. Remember what I said earlier, where it doesn't matter what side the door is swinging to. You need it on 24 within 24 inches of both sides of that door. So you really don't have. As long as that bifold closet's not more than three feet deep, though, you're cool. Yeah, and typically your closets are what, 21 inches? Four. 24 inches, 21 inch clearance for your hangers. I mean, that's what we always looked at it as. Glazing in an individual fixed operable panel that meets all of the following conditions shall be considered a hazardous location. This is probably the next biggest question I get. How low can I go to the floor? with a window. Charlie? How low can you go? How, how low can you go? It's the first floor, you can go as low as you want. As as you correct. He, he's correct. So then the next question is, does it need to be uh, safety glazing? Only if the bottom sash exceeds nine feet. And that's what you, and it's, it has to meet, you know, all of these, but yeah. what you're looking for is the exposed area of individual paint is larger than nine square feet. So what is that saying? If you have a 3030 equal sash window, would that mean the bottom sash needs to be tempered? Probably not because when you do your reduction for your frames, you know, your pane of glass is going to be smaller than that. But we also had this discussion, a, a, three, uh, a 3070, but still, now keep in mind, windows vary. You have different size frames if you're going with an impact. Your, your glass is going to be smaller, of course, that's safety glaze, you know, it would have safety glaze and all, but, so, you really need to know what the pane of glass is to make that decision, but exposed area, individual pane is larger than nine square feet, the bottom edge of the glazing is less than 18 inches above the floor, that's the next step, so if you're 20 inches, you're good. The top edge of the glazing is more than 36 inches above the floor. One or more walking surfaces are within 36 inches measured horizontally or straight line of the glazing. You think that one, I, well maybe I'm jumping ahead, but the, one of the ones, uh, issues that I see a lot of is especially like in uh, Maison du Lac or something when they're doing a courtyard swimming pool, a lot of times I don't realize those pools are right up against uh, in a walking surface and if that walking surface has windows around it, then all the windows are falling in that hazardous location. Right, correct. Now, uh, we will get into that later on with wet locations. And basically what the rule on that is 60 inches, uh, you know, for wet locations. Because it's another question we get a lot is about bathroom windows. On, in that location, when you order a tempered window and it's to a dog, two pieces of glass because of below E requirements, are both sides of that thing tempered or just one side? How do they usually come? Both of them are, both of them are tempered? Some manufacturers will let you do an inbound. Some let you choose uh, if you want an inbound or an outbound piece, but I always do both. Just to be honest. Is there like a big cost difference between doing both as opposed to one? It tempered in general is, but uh, add it to the window, but just to make the outbound panes say tempered, the cost is minimal for what you're getting. You know? And that's where you start cheating and the cost. Obviously the reason is if you're putting windows on the patio that has a pool. Well, is it a safety hazard to the, it, from the inside or is it just a safety hazard from the outside? Okay, but within 24 inches of a door, it may be on both sides. Either way, you know, coming from both sides. And a cost, so the key here is the cost is not significant to order both sides of that double pane glass to be tempered. Just yeah, I, I would. The way to cheat that, the reason you cheated is if you're trying to nickel and dime the job down. 
to, to do only well, the well, exterior. Here's the thing though, if the dang windows are special order to get anything other than both sides tempered, what little bit you're going to save is not worth the time you want. Well, if you got 10 windows along a run next to the pool, and all of a sudden I'm saving you 80, you know, 80 bucks a window. Yeah, but you, then, if you, if you don't lose bucks. a month on the job, you're paying the interest on the money, it's probably not worth it. Cool. Right, yeah. right. So I mean, it's just a it's an economical decision that you would have to make. But you bring up a good point um, that a lot of people don't think about. So you have to look at what is the hazardous side of this window. If if you're in a bathroom or something, okay. So the inside is your hazardous side, not your outside. You agree with that, Chris? Well, yeah. The only thing I would add to that is, you know, go back to what is the real intent of having the safety blazing. It's if somebody, if an occupant or an individual is falling and that window breaks, you don't want them to get stabbed by a big shard of glass. So, you know, talking about one side or the other being safety glazing, if they fall through one, that next pane of glass is not gonna is not gonna break their fall, is not gonna stop their fall. The tip and one might will be strong enough to keep them from going through the second pane. Correct. Yeah, so I mean you're still you know, I would look at it that, you know, if a, if a tempered window or safety glazing is required, both sides would need to be yeah, and I'm just going back to what, you know, inspectors are looking for. They're usually walking through the house and they come down and they look for the etching in the glass. Because remember, all safety glazing is going to have etching in, in the glass. Can you switch to Not true. One of the, <laughs> supposed to. That was one of the things that I was wanting to bring up, too. So on these, because um, I actually had this experience, um, real high-end house, real high-end renovation, you probably wouldn't see it unless it's a situation like that. But the lady of the house was insistent on keeping the look of the historic glass, the more leaded glass. Dependable does have, did have a product where it's a more of a laminated product and it was, it did qualify with the ASTM rating as safety glazing, but it was a complete special order product and it did not have the etching. So, um, you know, we did have to, you know, get the document, get the documentation on the glazing and everything else, but he's right that I was questioning it because there was no etching in that location. So if it would help us if you know that it's required to be safety glazing and there's no etching and it's a special order product like that, just go ahead and have the documentation mm -hmm. ready. I, I had to go do that on a frosted glass and they couldn't find the etching. Yeah, and, and if you read the, um, the 2015 commentary, it does, you know, basically talk about what Chris just talked about, and it does say that, you know, you know it does have the etching and all. Yes, sir? What about pictured windows or fixed windows, like a 3 over 7 out? Well, there's a lot of exceptions in there for decorative. Um, and if you're 18 inches off the ground. You're talking about picture windows or decorative glass? Picture window. Oh, no. Fix the window. Fix the window. If it's on uh, the, the nine square feet. If it's, not, if it's over nine square feet, you should be tempted. Yeah, that's, you know, nine square feet uh, within 18 inches of the floor. Uh, but if you're talking about just a regular. 18 inches off the floor. You don't have to. You don't have to. That's right. Mm -hmm. it's gotta be, because it's got to meet all. Yeah, of those these are correct. And not or. Okay. Right, right. And these are and. Keep in, mind, excuse me, can you keep in mind that some window manufacturers will automatically put in tempered over a certain square foot. Some exactly. of them are 25 square feet, some of them are 30. They automatically give you tempered without a choice. Yeah, I, 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 I'm always, when in doubt, put it. If it looks like it needs it, put it. If it's, you know, it's a safety thing, you can't put a price on safety. All right. Um, now there are exceptions to, to some of these, like, like some of the last ones and stuff. And I didn't put it in there because in 26 years that I've been doing this, I have yet to see it in a residential house where somebody puts a guardrail up in front of their windows. I did. 
Yeah, right I mean, after Katrina in the I haven't state. seen it, and, and and somebody may have done it to get around they because did they didn't to meet get code. The temperate thing. They because they didn't meet did. code. Okay, so with this is a glazing and guard railing. So if you want to use glass for your guard rails, you see it along the coast a lot. You see it in some high-end homes and things like that. They'll want to do glass and all. Of course, that needs to be uh, safety glazing. Uh, glazing and wet surfaces. This is where we're going to get into your pools and, and, and stuff. So, uh, glazing and walls, enclosures, or fences containing or facing hot tubs, spas, whirlpools, saunas, steam rooms, bathtubs, showers, indoor, outdoor swimming pools. So, if it's wet, this is where this is all going to take you know, come into effect. Of course, in a shower or in a tub area, anything below 60 inches is going to require it. Of course, I know we got some tall people out there these days, you know, but that would need it. Uh, swimming pool, as you can see right here, this line 60 inches, five foot around that pool. Spa. So you see this is um, glazing outside the boundary to find the expand water's edge is not required here. Safety glazing is required here. Not required up there, so you just take a good look at that. Uh, here's another little illustration that, that talks about safety glazing. Here's your, your 60 inches right there from your tub, walking distance, things like that. The question was, what about outside of a tub or shower? And uh, so what it is, 60 inches, that's going to carry. So if you're in a bathroom, 60 inches around that wet area, that tub as you've seen on that previous slide that, that you know stated that, is it the drain you measure from or the standing surface? The, the edge of the water. So the edge of the water, 60 inches out, if you have a window there, you're going to need to have it glazing, safety glazing. And above the toilet? If it's below 60 inches, you need it. Okay. So, and that's a question that always comes up. Well, I got a window behind a toilet. Yeah. Where's the toilet located in relation to the... And for years no one ever you know, did anything on it. To the shower. Can't comment on what was done in the past. All I can comment on is what is code, what's yeah. not. Or what jurisdiction you're in. And you know, we get, we get questions a lot. They say, do y'all enforce this? <laughs> we enforce the code to the best of our ability as it's written. All right, glazing adjacent to stairs and ramps. Glazing where the bottom of the exposed edge of the glazing is less than 36 inches above the plane of the adjacent walking surface of stairways, landings between flights of stairs, and ramps shall be considered a hazardous location. So what is that saying? You come down the stairs and you have a window coming down. If it's uh, up to that 36 inch point, and there was always confusion on it because everybody wanted to carry that 60 inch rule all the way down, but the code actually says 36. Chris, comment? Well, you're going to have a uh, handrail. You're going to have some protection. You have the protection yeah, of, the, of the handrail, but you may not have it on a landing because the landing is considered a floor or surface. So, but, you know, that's, that was confusion. Now, I don't know if that was a change in the code over the years, but... So, on the landing, if that, that window ledge is 36 inches above the floor of the landing, then you don't have to have it. If it goes below that, you got to have it, at least in the bottom half of the sack. Correct. And here's some exceptions. Um, where a rail is installed on accessible side of it, uh, glazing 34 to 30 inch, uh, 38 inches above the walking surface. So you have a window and a stairwell behind the, the, the rail, you don't need to be glazed. Exception glazing 36 inches or more, uh, or more measured horizontally from the walking surface. Here's your stairs, here's your landing, safety glazing required right here. Here's your 36 inch mark. Uh, safety glazing not required above it. Of course, you look at this, you see 36 right here and say, well, why does this one need it? Because you're over the stairs within 36 inches from the plane of the stairs. And remember, whenever you measure anything on stairs, handrails, headroom, I know this is kind of off the subject, handrails, uh, headroom, you always measure from the slope of the stairs. 
So if you lay a straight edge across the nosing of the stairs all the way down, that's where you take your measurement from, not back here. We do get that a lot where, you know, people measure it from that, especially when they're putting up handrails. They measure it sometimes they're, you know, cocked, they're not on the same slope as the stairs going down. It might be 34 inches on this end, it's 39 inches up at the top because they're measuring it from different places. But always keep that in mind when dealing with stairs. You're looking at the slope of the stairs. Another uh, illustration here where it talks about where safety glazing is required. Now at the bottom of the stairs, and there's another slide uh, down here, at the bottom of the stairs it's 60 inches out. And it's 60 inches around that, there's like a radius around that bottom of that stairs that if it's within there it needs safety glazing. So if you have a landing halfway down the stairs, is that equals to 60? No. No? Here's your landing halfway down your stairs. So what it's saying here is everything below 36 inches needs to be safety glazing. Glazing adjacent to the bottom of the stair landing. Glazing adjacent to the landing, bottom stairway where the glazing is less than 36 inches above the landing and within a 36 inch horizontal arc. Less 180 degrees from the bottom tread and nosing uh, shall be considered hazardous location and this is what they're talking about that. So you're coming down the stairs, any windows in there within 60 inches, 36 inches down, it needs to be safety glazing. It's a big one there. You see that a lot. This is something that they put in a code about uh, two or three cycles ago where it's talking about fall protection um, for windows. And it was just one of those things that was always, how high do I have to, I asked Charlie this question earlier, how high does a window have to be off the floor? Well, on the ground floor, there, you know, there's really no minimum. You could go all the way down to the, to the floor if you want, provided you have your safety glazing. But once you elevate that house and get, you know, and you start talking about two-story houses or raised houses, uh, they do have a section in the code and it's moved around. It was in walls, so you had to go in and, and you know, find it, but it, it is in there where it should be where it is now, where it's near the guardrails and stuff like that. So what it's talking about is fall protection, window sills, and dwelling units where the top of the sill of an operable window opening is located less than 24 inches above finished floor or greater than 72 inches above the finished grade or other surface below on the exterior of the building. The operable window shall comply with the following, or one of the following. Operable windows with openings that will not allow a four inch spear to pass through the opening where the opening is in its largest open position. That's the uh, limiting device. Okay. You know, one of the limiting, you know, the bottom line. Yeah. Provided the window fall uh, prevention devices comply with ASTM 2090. Charlie, do you know if these comply with uh, ASTM F2090? Yes, that's right. This is what the window manufacturer. You need the red. <laughs> this is what does it. And what this is, it prevents them being able to open past that four, four inches. inches. So if you notice four inches, where do they get four inches? What is the same four inches that you talk about with guard rails when you're talking about um, your intermediate rails or your spindles or balusters? You, you have to maintain where a four inch ball can't pass through it. Don't mean they could be four inches apart, it means that a four inch ball can't pass through it, a sphere. So, so we get into, yes sir. I went into a house recently and I had to put them on there and they took them off already. So the top has code on that in my good the, in, the, the, the inspectors when they see this, and I highly recommend that, that inspectors, you know, all over take pictures. We're all on MP, uh, my permit or my government online. It's very easy to upload pictures. Same thing with, with we run into the same thing with handrails all the time. People want to do stairs coming up the front with wing walls and they do not want handrails. And you know, it's a, it's a constant battle and they take them down. I tell the inspectors, if it doesn't, if it don't look permanent, or if it, if it looks a little shady, take pictures of it, upload pictures to it, question a homeowner, question a contractor. And uh, we actually have uh, cited people and gone back on them because they remove handrails almost immediately. And you know, we cited them and, and, and brought them back into compliance. 
y'all pass it though, right? If Sir? Both of us would be saying that it was done, correct? Right? Like if y'all pass it and it's told, y'all would let it pass without it passing. So I mean, wouldn't it be falling back to them asking y'all and y'all saying it was there? Right? I'm just wondering, because they already said y'all have told me to put a more work. We, we, we really don't have any legal responsibility to go back and, and, yeah. and check something, especially on the interior of a house, something that somebody may have modified or something. I mean, if we don't know about it, you know what I'm saying? And, you know, a lot of these codes are for us, but it's also for people to protect themselves against themselves. Kenny, on a footnote with those little devices, guys, I, in my opinion, if you don't have to use those, don't. Uh, get your window 24 inches off the floor. Those things, as you see, are pretty flimsy. They break easy. So, you know, they won't survive through the construction process. They're going to get broken. Those things are about $15 a piece. And uh, uh, as you see, they're bright orange. But the other thing that scares me about that is uh, a builder doing a spec home, puts those in there, sells it. Nobody discusses with the homeowner that that's there and what that's for to a child or something like that. To me, it's, it's another gamble. Chris? Well, I'll just house. mention, you may, have a, you may have a slide on this. I'm not going to accept these if it's got to be an egress one. This that was would the other fall under the uh, requires special knowledge. Yeah. You know, if it's got to be, a, if you have this situation, I mean, if you have this situation in a bedroom, this is not going to work. So which one? So you're saying the egress it's is more important it, than the child falling out the window? No, it's got to be 24 inches off the ground. If it's in a bedroom. Okay. And this is just a little illustration that you know just went over what we just talked about. And remember, finished grade what we're talking about. And that grade is going to come into play when you start talking about emergency escape and rescue openings too. And here it is. Emergency escape and rescue openings. Basements. Habitable attics. And every sleeping room shall have not less than one operable emergency escape and rescue opening or most of the industry calls it an egress window. The correct term is an emergency escape and rescue opening. Okay, and, and notice I said habitable attic and I kind of said a little bit louder, trying to get your attention on it. Uh, this is straight out of the code book. I put the definition of a habitable attic. A finished or unfinished area, not considered a story, complying with all of the following requirements. The occupiable floor area is not less than 70 square feet. The occupiable floor area has a ceiling height of 7 feet. The occupiable space is enclosed by a roof assembly above, knee walls maybe, or other walls on the size of floor ceiling assembly and a floor ceiling assembly below. So what is that saying? If you have a attic that meets those and you have a disappearing stairs to get up there and all. Well, if you got to climb up a disappearing stairs, I'm not looking at that as a habitable attic. Chris? Thank you. The same. Um, disappearing stairs, my opinion, ought to be outlawed because they're dangerous. If you're trying to, they should be just for equipment access, in my opinion, just because they're dangerous. Um, so, so what we're talking about a habitable attic. So you're going to build a, you're going to have a future build out. You're going to have a bonus room over the garage and you want to, you want to, you know, you're going to have your knee walls, your, your floor ceiling, uh, assemblies, roof assemblies. You need to think about an emergency escape and rescue opening. Put a dormer in, let's get it done at that point. Uh, question always comes up and opinions are going to differ from jurisdiction to jurisdiction, build an official, build an official, even inspect an inspector. If you have a two-story house, well, of course, it, it, wouldn't, it wouldn't pertain to that because it says not considered a story. But what I was going to say is if you have a walk-in attic from your second floor, you know what I'm saying? Like an attic access door that walks into it and all of a sudden it's a giant attic. Now, would you consider a habitable attic and inspectors, Chris, feel uh, free to chime in here. If you have a bonus room 
per se, going to a, over a, a room over a garage with no windows. Um, it's just a enclosed room. Plans don't call it a sleeping room. There's no, no closets, no bathrooms, anything. Uh, so really, I, I would think that's a habitable attic. And it's a different level, too. So. It's on a different level. Uh, I mean, it's, that's an opinion. That's one of those things where, you know, it's a difficult decision, uh, you know, to, to tell somebody this because people have different intents of what they're using it for. But somebody brought up a good point with once you turn it over to an owner or, or um, they sell it to somebody else and it doesn't get relayed that this is not a sleeping room or something like that. We had that years ago when I first started in St. Tammany Parish. I walked into a house and the plan showed it as a three bedroom house and a real estate flyer calls it a beautiful three bedroom plus bonus room slash fourth bedroom on there. Okay, well, you just handed yourself a length of rope because now it's a bedroom. So, and then when you ask ICC, the International Code Council, for an interpretation of it, they always fall back to, what do the plans say? Ken, what's the difference between habitable and occupied? Well, habitable can be finished or unfinished. It can be either or. Yeah, occupiable, I would say, would be finished. Yeah. Good point. Minimum opening area is 5.7 square feet for a uh, emergency escape and rescue opening. Uh, needs to be a minimum 20 inches of clear opening in width, 24 inches clear opening in height. That's not the size of the window, including the frame, that's the actual opening from the top of the bottom lip of the window to the, to the, to the bottom of the sash. A lot of these windows have removable stops and all of that to help you get at that. Typically, been my experience that most, not all, but most 3050 windows make this. However, that's what an equal sash window. But if you get into um, heavier uh, design pressures, you get into impact windows, that frame gets bigger. The opening gets smaller. You have to go to like a probably a, a, a 3056 or something like that to be able to make this. There is an exception to this, and it's called a grade floor window. What is a grade floor window? A window located such that the sill height of the opening is not more than 44 inches above finished grade. So it's not from the inside. It's from the outside, finished grade. That, so with that, you could go down to five square feet or 720 square inches. Now keep in mind these emergency escape and rescue openings are not just for the occupant to get out of the house it's also for emergency personnel to be able to get in there. But everybody knows what's a fireman going to do when he gets there? He's going to go through it with his axe and make that opening uh, to, to, to size. <laughs> Uh, here's a little illustration that shows that um, different windows. This is a open, you know, operable area. It's probably one of those doo -doo 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 casement windows there. Okay, question on that. I get asked a lot uh, if they're going to be more than 44, can they build a, a platform underneath to access the window? I think one time we discussed it had to be the 36 inch type of platform or something like a. a box for the toy, toy box or something like that. Um, that comes into question quite a few times. It does. People ask, can they do a window seat and yeah. all this other stuff? But typically, I think the intent here is that they have a floor. The code, did they put something in there? I didn't read it yesterday. I think, so the intent of that is not just so that an occupant can get out, but like you were saying, that a fireman can get in and so what they're trying to prevent there is for a fireman coming in to that window and stumbling over out or not. but coming into that window expecting there to be a floor the room is filled with smoke his visibility is not real good and then he falls five feet to the, to the ground or he trips over the and, uh, the um, window seat 
you know, getting in and falls. I'm okay generally with, with a window seat as long as it's permanently installed, as long as it's, you know, big enough that, again, thinking about a fireman trying to come in yeah, and we, we've done that too. We've worked with people on that. Is, there a, is he going to fall? Is there a design width on that? Is it going to be 24 inches wide? Or? No. That's, no. That's purely... If you want to go by code, it's going to be 36 inches because it's going to call for a floor. Yeah, it's purely inspected by inspector, just kind of what... I, I mean, if you want to go by the letter of the code, it's 44 inches and it really right. doesn't say anything about mm -hmm. window seats or window no. Question always comes up. Well, can I have that window in my closet to get to the outside? Can this window open up into a courtyard in the center of the house? Uh, can it open up into a a carport or um, or porch area? Well, we got several different answers there, but this window has to be directly from the room directly to the outside. It can be under a porch and all, but it has to lead directly from the room to the outside, not through a closet, not through a bathroom. Not into an enclosed courtyard either. Not into it. Yeah, we don't see many of those, but um, from time to time, I think they've done one in, in uh, Slotel that was in a parade of homes a few years ago where they had a swimming pool or something in the middle of the house. It's very popular. Is it? Well, the, all the bedrooms probably have an emergency escape and rescue to the exterior. Great floor window, we covered that. Uh, energy efficiency, typically. Low E windows uh, typically will meet the U factor of 0 0.65 and a solar heat gain coefficient of 0 0.35. And this is based on the 2009 energy portion of the International Residential Code. There's too many um, modifications to go up to the 2015 uh, energy efficiency section, so the State uh, Code <laughs> Council is stuck on a 2009 uh, efficiency. The legislature, the, legislature did that. Um, the legislature froze it at the 2000, so it was even above the Code Council. Gotcha. Gotcha. Chris used to be on the code council, so he knows all of that uh, better than me. But I just wanted to put this in there for your information. I think the window guys, you know, they're pretty much all up to see. We haven't had this issue recently. When we first went to the 2006, I believe it was, uh, IRC, a lot of people, you know, we were doing that transition with the windows, uh, needing to, to make this energy efficiency rating. Some people were still wanting to use regular insulated windows. Uh, other ones were getting them from Home Depot, so we spent a lot of time in the box stores trying to, to get their management to, to uh, order windows for our climate zone down here, which we're in climate zone two. And so it took some years to get all of that straight, but I haven't seen um, any issues with energy rating on windows. Um, of course, there's exceptions for uh, decorative glass, stained glass, things like that. Windborne debris, uh, this is um, something that's changed over the years with the, with the wind speeds and stuff. Now it's a, if you're in a, uh, an area that has 140 mile per hour wind design, you're gonna need to provide windborne debris protection, which would either be impact windows, which are very costly, but I don't think it's such a bad idea. Uh, or you could use half inch plywood panels to cover them. They do have a nailing, I mean a screwing schedule in there, a fastening schedule I guess is the proper term for it. Uh, in, the, in the code book there is a fastening schedule. I didn't go into all of that, you know, we wanted to concentrate more on just the window. Or all your coastal areas, Danny, I know you build uh, all those houses up by the lake and stuff. Uh, you know, those... The lake, the lake is considered coastal. Yes. Yes, the lake is considered coastal. Here in St. Tammany Parish, our wind speeds go from about 126 to about 135, something like that. So we're under the 140. So if you're building along the Lake Pontchartrain and you're within one mile, you need to think about the windborne debris protection.